about death, but we don't understand it. Ghost stories are speculations, little experiments in death. We try it on for size, never quite fits. Good, we say, it's nothing to do with us, this death. But what about that other death over there? What's that one about? There are always new deaths to marvel at, deaths that create a shiver of pleasure because they are not ours, not yet. Ghost stories are a literature of loneliness and longing. Ghost stories can be violent, grotesque, thrilling, repulsive. But the quieter, more desperate stories resonate more intensely. They are powered by grief and loss, separation and finality. Death is a mystery. Comfort is scarce. But we will play with our bereavements. We will invent little amusements that explode with sorrow. Thus, we will armor ourselves against inevitable loss. The ghost story transcends, transcends time and culture. Tales of ghosts and haunted places reverberate through the literatures of ancient Greece and Rome, the Old Testament, and the 1001 Nights. The tales of Genji include harrowing ghost stories. Ghost stories pervade Shakespeare's plays and John Donne's poetry. The wrongness of the ghost is the same across all cultures. Something is seriously out of place. Now, if you thought that didn't sound like me, that's because that is an excerpt from the introduction of Ghostly, a collection of ghost stories introduced and illustrated by Audrey Neffenegger. I used it because it shows mankind's fascination with ghost stories. It's nothing new, for ghost stories have existed in cultures for as long as we have records for. As Ms. Neffenegger says, ghost stories have such an appeal because of the mystery that surrounds death. What happens after death? Is that it for us, or is there some future? If there is a future, do our spirits go to some other realm, or do they remain here on this earth to haunt or visit the living? And the truth is, the people of this world simply do not know, because nobody has returned from the dead to tell them. For the Christian, though, we don't turn to the wisdom of the world, to learn about death. We turn, around, we turn to the Bible, the word of God, the only source of knowledge about what happens after death. For God is the only one who truly knows all things. So with that in mind, what does the Bible say about death and specifically about the existence of ghosts? And the reason I've chosen this is because I was asked to preach on a lesson like this uh, for questions that people have had. So to begin with, we must first understand what we mean when we use the word ghost. What we're talking about is the spirit of a dead person that can appear to the living. This spirit doesn't have a body like you and I do, but is usually dressed in white or in black, although in literature they are depicted in many colors. Does the Bible speak of ghosts? Well, it might surprise you, but the answer is yes. Turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, we're going to read verses 22 to 33. Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand 
and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now this event occurred after Jesus fed the 5,000. Following this miracle, Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat and to travel to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now from the context, we know that Jesus fed the 5,000 on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So when he told his disciples to go to the other side, he was telling them to go to the west side towards Galilee itself. Jesus, however, didn't go with them. He went into the mountain by himself to pray. That Jesus took time in solitude to go and pray shows us the importance that Jesus placed on prayer. Jesus is the Son of God. From our perspective, what could Jesus possibly be praying for? Perhaps it's our misunderstanding of all that prayer is that gives us this idea. When many people think of prayer, they think of it almost like a wish list. I want to pray for my health. I want to pray for someone else's health. I want to pray for my job. I want to pray for this. I want to pray for that. But is that all that prayer is? In Jesus' most famous prayer, in Matthew 6, listen to the words that lead up to the prayer and then the prayer itself. Matthew chapter 6, beginning of verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in, secret, in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Prayer is not to be done to be seen of men. Now, yes, the scriptures do contain passages that speak of public prayer, but that's usually in the context of a public assembly. In those cases, though, we should not be praying simply to be appearing to others to be religious. We have our reward if we do that, the praise of men, but we do not have the praise of God. We also shouldn't think of prayer as a means of informing God of our needs. For God knows our needs before we ask him. If God knows our needs, then why pray? Let me ask parents in the audience. Do your children ask you for things that they think they need, even though most of the time you already know what they need before you, they ask for it? And the answer is yes. Does that mean that since you know their needs, you want them to stop asking? No. Now why is that? Because asking teaches children the, to put reliance and trust in their parents to provide for their needs. It teaches children humility in realizing that they need to depend on others to provide for their needs. And it teaches children to be grateful and thankful for the needs that their parents provide. Now, the same is true with God. Yes, God knows our needs, but in praying to God, we're strengthening our faith in him as our provider and humbling ourselves and allowing him to provide the things that we need. And it provides us an opportunity to thank him for what he has already done and praise him for the willingness to do all of those things. You see, prayer is not just a laundry list of things we wished for. It's a conversation with God. It's a time to grow closer to God. It's a time where we can grow our faith. Jesus was using this time as an opportunity to speak directly to the Father. 
he was practicing what he preached by doing so in private because the discussion he was having was not done to show others how special he was as the son of God, but so that he could commune with his father in heaven even while he was down here on this earth. So back to the story. Jesus was on the mountain praying, and the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee rowing to the other side. It was night. And so without electricity, like we might have to provide light, it would have been dark. Now on a clear night, they might have had the stars and the moon for some light, but the Sea of Galilee was situated on the west side of a mountain range. Rain and windstorms thus easily, be, easily were whipped up, just as it happened on that night, meaning it was pitch black. The time was the fourth watch of the night, meaning that it was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. when Jesus came to them walking on the water. Now this morning, I had Bill in the audience, who sometimes is up between 3 and 6. But if I were to ask Jeff, if he's up at 3 o'clock, something is badly wrong. Because he doesn't like getting up at that time. And I don't either. But if you were on the water that night, and you saw the storm, you would have been up. Because you probably would have been thinking that the water is going to come into the boat, it's going to capsize the boat. You're all going to drown. And it had been like that probably all night. So the disciples were awake all night, having been up the entire day before. So they were tired. And so when they looked out on the sea and saw something, all they saw was a dark shadow, sort of like what I had up on the, on the title page earlier. They knew it was something, but they couldn't tell what. Whenever we see something that we don't know what it is, we're afraid because we don't know whether it is this something is a friend or a foe. Now, what did they do? In fear, they yelled out, it was a ghost. Now, if the disciples were on land, perhaps they might have thought that this was an intruder. But here on the sea, what they saw was this figure walking on the water, something that men and women can't do. So they thought it had to be a spirit, a ghost coming towards them. We need to be careful how we interpret this statement, though. The Bible is simply telling us that the disciples said it was a ghost. It's not analyzing the validity of that statement or confirming or denying the existence of ghosts that may or may not roam this earth. Now, we know it wasn't a ghost. We know it was Jesus walking on the water. He called out to them, identifying who he was, and the disciples initially didn't believe. So Peter called out to him and said, If you're Jesus, command me to go out and walk on the water. Jesus agreed, and at first, Peter did walk on the water. However, after a lack of faith, he began to sink, and Jesus had to save him. After which, Jesus got on the boat. The storm calmed, making the rest of the trip across the Sea of Galilee rather uneventful. So this scary figure here wasn't a ghost. It was Jesus. And apart from this one story, the word ghost does not appear anywhere else in any other context in Scripture. But the word spirit does. And there is another passage in Matthew that some might think shows that spirits do roam this earth, a lot like we think of ghosts doing today. Turn now to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and, rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. Now on its face, it appears that Jesus is confirming that unclean spirits, when they are cast out, go out to dry places or deserted places until they decide to return again and possess man. But is that what he is saying here? 
In both Matthew and Mar and sorry, Matthew and Luke's account of what Jesus says here, he they both tie it into the scribes and Pharisees' false notion that Jesus had a demon and was casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, or the devil. They also tied it in with the fact that this evil generation was seeking after a sign, claiming that they would only believe if they saw that sign, in spite of the fact that Jesus had performed already so many signs, and they didn't believe. Knowing this, let's back up in Matthew 12 and get the fuller context, starting at verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man, so, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And he comes, when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of men is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. From my research of this passage, it appears that at that time the Jews believed the demons who were cast out went and haunted deserted places before returning. And when they returned and found whom they were cast out empty, meaning lacking faith, they gathered some of their demon friends, possessed that person again, and the last state was worse than the first due to the fact that this person was now possessed by multiple demons. So Jesus told the Jews that Nineveh and the Queen of Sheba would rise up in judgment against this generation due to the fact that Nineveh had heard the preaching of Jonah and the Queen of Sheba heard the wisdom of Solomon, yet there was one who was greater than both Jonah and Solomon, Jesus, present among them, yet they rejected him. So when he gets to verse 43 then, what he is doing is he's using the Jews' belief among, about demons in order to teach a lesson. He is not necessarily confirming that this is exactly what happens when demons are cast out, but he is making a comparison by using something that they already know. What was Jesus' point? He went out preaching the gospel, casting out demons, and the apostles would soon follow. This would cause belief in the gospel to spread in Israel. However, the nation as a whole would later turn away from the gospel. Not everybody but as a whole. In other words, demons or evil would return. Israel would become unbelievers and their city would be destroyed. The situation would be worse than before because in rejecting the gospel, that meant they could no longer serve God for God would only accept service through his son, Jesus Christ. It was a sobering thought for the Jews, but it is even more sobering for us today. Jesus demands that we obey the gospel. If we hear the gospel, though, yet don't obey it, we're in a somewhat worse condition than ones who have never heard it. No, our sin is not any more worse, but in the sense that we had the opportunity to obey, yet chose not to, that's worse. Our punishment will be the same as those who never heard the gospel, but our sorrow over what we know we gave up will likely be great. The point of Matthew 12, though, is not to confirm the existence of ghosts. But even if it was, the topic is not ghosts of the dead returning to haunt us. It's demons, non-human evil beings that have aligned themselves with Satan. And scriptures say that although these beings still do exist today, and I believe they assist Satan in helping to lead man to sin, they don't possess people today. 
In Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, we read, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. The fountain opened to the house of David was Jesus. And in those days, among other things, unclean spirits, demons, would pass out of the land, meaning that they would no longer possess people. And that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. For in Matthew 12, verses 25 to 30, Jesus said, Every kingdom divided itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub, by what power do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Jesus came to bind the strong man, to tie up the power of Satan and plunder his house, save mankind from sin. And Jesus continues to plunder Satan's house today, meaning that the strong man is still bound. Yes, he can tempt us and lead us into sin, but he cannot overpower us. So Matthew 12 doesn't teach us that ghosts roam this earth. Matthew 14 doesn't teach us that ghosts roam this earth. Is there any other passage we can turn to that might show us that ghosts roam this earth? Well, what about 1 Samuel? Chapter 28, Let's start reading at verse 3. First Samuel 28, begin reading at verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and camped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all, to, uh, all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the armies of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit descending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me in, by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. And Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn your kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. 
Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. What Saul was doing here was in direct violation of the law of Moses. For the Hebrews were not to seek the aid of mediums, psychics, astrologers, or the like. Because those are people who are involved in the occult and had no real power. However, Saul was afraid and desperate because the Lord wouldn't speak to him. So he consulted a medium and asked her to perform a seance, a way that people supposedly speak to the dead, so that he could talk to Samuel. Now I'm sure this woman fully intended to do what she normally did and simply lie to Saul about what she heard, for she was a fraud. However, because the Lord willed, Samuel's spirit did come up and speak to Saul. But this was something that was unusual, and the way we know it was unusual was that the medium cried out when she actually saw Samuel, for she wasn't expecting to see anything. This is the only time in Scripture that I can think of where a spirit of someone actually returned to this earth and spoke to man without being physically resurrected from the dead. I know what we have in the transfiguration, but I don't believe that's exactly the same as what we're talking about here. In, in the Bible, we have God appearing to man. We have angels appearing to man. But as far as I know, we don't have mankind appearing to man. So even this scripture can't be used to show that in general ghosts roam this earth to haunt or speak to man. In truth, as I said at the beginning, the reason we have ghost stories and believe that ghosts haunt this earth is because we do not fully understand what happens at death. And while the scriptures don't reveal everything, they do reveal some things. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, there Solomon writes, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw nigh when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of the grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of the bird and all the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. We're to remember our creator in the days of our youth, so that we don't waste our lives in sin, and then when we are old, look back at our days and regret our choices. But we're to remember our Creator in the days of our youth because one day we will meet our Creator, for one day we will die. And when we die, our spirit will leave our body behind to return to the earth as it was. But our spirit will return to God who gave it. God is the creator of life. Not only physical life, but he is the creator of our spirit. Our physical body borrows our spirit for a period of time, and that is why we are physically alive. But when it's time for us to die, our spirit returns to God. It is not abandoned here on this earth to roam about. And it does not possess other physical bodies to live on in a reincarnated state. The spirit returns to God. The question is, in what condition will it return? Will it return filthy due to unforgiven sin? Or will it return spotless, washed in the blood of the Lamb, free from sin by the grace provided by God through faith? 
if it returns filthy. All that one could look forward to is the resurrection of judgment and eternal punishment in hell. If it returns spotless, though, one will receive the resurrection of life and live, eternity, live eternally with God in heaven. So what of you today? Are you a Christian? If you are, our journey is not over. We need to continue walking faithfully until death or until Christ comes again, fully trusting in God's grace to save us. But if we're not, now is the best time to change that. All you need to do is believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess your faith before others, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. It's that simple. Why not do it today? I'm not.